Hello, I'm Jonathan Men, the director of Equipping Church Leaders East Africa, otherwise known as ECLEA, um, and this is the first in a series of lectures on the subject of biblical eschatology. Uh, the lectures we'll be following our book on biblical eschatology, which uh, is located on the ECLEA Courses and Resources page of the ECLEA website at www.eclea.net. Now, our book on biblical eschatology uh, is one of our longest books uh, in the English uh, version. Um, we have uh, 200, over 250 pages, or about 250 pages of text. Um, so I would recommend that you get that book uh, and read it because it will contain far more detail than I will be able to go through in these lectures. Um, but uh, I will try and hit the high points uh, in these lectures. And so you can put the two together. What I will be saying here in these lectures will supplement uh, what you read and uh, that will make the whole subject much clearer. Now, eschatology... Um, comes from two Greek words, eschatos, uh, which means farthest or last, and logos, which means word or study. So basically, eschatology uh, is the study of the last things, the final part of God's program. And for many people, eschatology uh, is, is just... Uh, either unknown or it's very confusing. But I think as we go through these lectures, we are going to see that eschatology makes sense. Uh, it uh, is an important part of the overall biblical storyline. And the Bible has a clear eschatological structure, uh, which when we understand that, it will help all the component parts of eschatology fit together. Now, there are lots of different eschatological views, um, and we will be talking about the major positions. Um, but again, many of these different views stem from the fact that people uh, simply do not take into account or even know that there is an overall eschatological structure of the Bible, and they don't know how to understand prophecy and apocalyptic uh, which we will be talking about in the next lecture. Uh, but first, we need to understand that eschatology uh, is uh, part of the overall biblical story. And so when we are considering eschatology, uh, we need to consider it in the context of, of the overall biblical story. And in short, the basic uh, biblical story uh, is that God created a beautiful world, and human beings to live joyful, fulfilled lives in fellowship with him. Um, however, through our sin, beginning in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and continuing with each one of us since then, we lost that fellowship and brought evil and death into the world. But God did not leave us uh, in our sin and death. By means of a grand plan, which involved the calling of Abraham and the nation of Israel, he prepared the way for his own coming into uh, the world in the person of Jesus Christ to bring forgiveness and to restore fellowship between people and God. And Jesus is coming again. Um, and he will, when he comes, he will utterly destroy sin and death without destroying us. He will consummate our relationship uh, uh, with him and he will renew the earth to be even more glorious than it was when it was first created. His goal is to live a perfect, holy, loving, familial relationship with humanity in a perfect environment in which all relationships have been restored to perfection. Now, God himself is both the author of the story and its primary character. Um, and so eschatology basically deals with how God is going to bring this story to completion. Um, 
Now, I should point out there are really a couple of aspects of eschatology, what are known as individual eschatology, namely what happens to people after they die, and corporate eschatology. In other words, God's overall plan for human beings and for creation and how that plan is consummated. This book and these lectures will primarily deal with corporate eschatology, uh, although there is, of course, overlap between individual and corporate eschatology. Now, the major questions we have to wrestle with as we try to understand what the Bible says about eschatology include such things as, do the second coming of Christ, the resurrection uh, and judgment of humanity, and the inauguration of the eternal kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth, do they occur as aspects of one great event, or are they separated uh, by a temporary messianic kingdom that lasts a thousand years? Secondly, are we able to predict when any of the end-time events will occur by paying attention to what's going on in the Middle East or other geopolitical occurrences? And what is the role of the church in all of this? Now, the major positions on eschatology differ over two main issues. First, the nature of the so-called thousand years. The term the thousand years uh, occurs only in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. Um, and the issue here is, is the so-called thousand years a discrete period of time distinct from the rest of history? And what does it look like? In other words, is it some kind of a golden age that is going to be coming in the future? Um, and secondly, uh, the issue is, when is the timing of the thousand years? Is the thousand years a past, present, or future period of time? And does it occur before or after Christ comes again? Now, the different answers to these main questions tend to be based on different answers to three hermeneutical issues. First, the role of the New Testament in interpreting the Old Testament. Second, how, how do we interpret the Bible's symbolic language? And third, what is the relationship between Israel and the church? And I should point out that uh, a number of these issues uh, are dealt with in our uh, Ecclesia books on biblical interpretation and biblical theology. Uh, those books are also on the Ecclesia courses and resources page of the website, and there are video lectures concerning both of those courses. So I highly recommend uh, that you take a look at those because they will help us in our understanding of eschatology. Now, uh, what I want to do now, and I hope this will not be too confusing, but I want to spend the rest of this lecture simply defining the major eschatological terms that occur again and again and again. So at least we should be introduced uh, to them now. Um, at its most basic level, there are two basic schemes of prophecy or eschatology, namely premillennialism and non-premillennialism. In other words, the primary issue is whether Christ's second coming precedes uh, or follows the thousand years of Revelation 20, verses 1 through 7. Those who hold that Christ will come again before the thousand years are called premillennialists. There are different branches of premillennialism. Those who contend uh, that uh, Christ will come after the thousand years are non-premillennialists, and there are different branches of non-premillennialism. Um, and so... Again, let's take a look at these major terms. I've used the term the millennium. The, the term is a Latin term, which means thousand years. Um, now, many people, when they hear the term millennium, uh, they automatically, uh, 
the connotation is. They automatically think of a golden age, um, but that may not at all be what the term thousand years, as found in Revelation chapter 20, suggests. Uh, one writer therefore says, it would be preferable not to speak of a millennium at all in this sense, uh, because John's, what he says about the thousand years in Revelation 20 uh, may not at all connote a golden age. However, the term millennium is so popular that there's little chance uh, that the prudence of that writer will be followed. So, but you need to understand, the term millennium is simply a Latin term that means thousand years, and that's the term thousand years that John used in Revelation 20. Now, I mentioned premillennialism. It's any belief that Christ will come before the millennium, before the thousand years. Um, all premillennialists believe that when Jesus comes again, he will institute a thousand-year reign, a golden age, on the earth uh, that will last, some say it will last a thousand years, some say it may last a long period, but a discrete period of time. In other words, premillennialists of whatever stripe believe that when Christ comes again, he will not begin or inaugurate the eternal state, that there is a temporary thousand year reign on the earth that they view as a golden age. And only after the millennium is over will Christ inaugurate the eternal state. Okay, So basically, according to premillennialism, there's three periods of time. The time period we are in now before Christ comes again. Then a discrete sort of golden age period of a thousand years. And then after that, the final state that will last forever. Now, there are um, two main branches of premillennialism, what are known as historic premillennialism and dispensational premillennialism. Um, historic premillennialists believe that any doctrine of the millennium, the thousand years, must be based on the New uh, Testament, and be consistent with the fact that Christ is reigning now from heaven. Uh, they believe there will be two bodily resurrections separated by the thousand years. The re uh, resurrection of the righteous when Christ comes again, and then the resurrection of the unrighteous after the thousand years. And then after that, the eternal state will be instituted. Now, contrary to that, there is what is known as dispensational premillennialism. Dispensational premillennialism holds that there is a radical distinction between the nation of Israel and the church, and that all prophecies must be fulfilled literally, uh, and that, uh, that prophetic promises to Old Testament Israel must be literally fulfilled uh, in the physical nation of Israel, not in the church. They view the millennium as the climax of God's dealings with Israel, uh, and they also hold that Christ will have two second comings. The first, when he comes partway to the earth, uh, which they call the pre-tribulational rapture. Now, this is only for the church. And at that point, uh, the church will leave the earth um, uh, and uh, they will meet Christ in the air and then the church will go back with Christ to heaven. And then after uh, what's called the great tribulation, uh, which most of them believe will there'll be a tribulation lasting about seven years, then Christ and his church will return to the earth. He'll come this time all the way to the earth uh, and set up the thousand-year kingdom in which Christ will physically reign uh, with his church on the earth from Jerusalem. Uh, uh, dispensational premillennialists also believe that there will be three resurrections. The first for the righteous dead, at the rapture. The second, at the end of the tribulation, for those believers, the saints, who died during the tribulation. And third, at the end of the millennium, for the unbelievers. And at the end of the thousand years, they hold there will be a great rebellion, uh, which Christ will overcome, and then he will institute the eternal state. Now, so those are the, uh, also I should point out, 
there is a third premillennial view uh, called, uh, I'm just blocking on it, and I so, I'm sorry about that, uh, called New Creation Millennialism, which was developed uh, by uh, a, an author named Mealy and uh, has, is, has been agreed to by some scholars, uh, including by Eckhart Schnabel, uh, who was one of my professors in theological school. Uh, new creation millennialism, we will talk about later uh, in the chapter and lectures on the millennium, when we will look at all of these views in more detail. Now, so those are the main views concerning um, the uh, premillennial positions. Now, the non-premillennial positions also have different variants. Uh, there is what is called postmillennialism. Now, uh, postmillennialists uh, believe that the millennium is a future discrete period of time before Christ comes again. But uh, they hold that it's going to be kind of a golden age based upon the church and the work of the Holy Spirit through the church so that the this golden age gradually emerges in history. And so sometime in the future, there will be tremendous Christian influence in the world. Uh, then Christ will come and receive the kingdom. And, and when he comes back, uh, he will institute the final state. Now, contrary to that is what is known as amillennialism. Now, amillennialists believe that the thousand years is a symbolic reference to the entire period between Christ's resurrection and shortly before he comes again. So, in other words, amillennialists hold that the thousand years is not a discrete period of a literal thousand years and that we are in the thousand years now. It's before he comes again and the, that the so-called thousand years, since it's a symbolic term, applies to the time we are in now. Uh, we will talk about the reasons for this when we discuss interpreting prophecy and discuss this in more detail, but uh, the point that amillennialists make is that in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is based on symbols, and every number or, you know, dating, uh, in the book of Revelation, is symbolic, not literal. Um, and so this, uh, the amillennialists believe that uh, even though the Bible uses the term, quote, thousand years, it's now lasted almost 2,000 years, and it will continue until sh uh, Christ, till shortly before Christ comes again, because the term thousand years is a symbolic uh, term. Now, amillennialists believe that when Christ uh, returns to the earth, uh, there will be First of all, there'll be no golden age before he returns, like the post-millennialists believe. And when he returns, he's not going to set up a temporary kingdom. He will institute the final state, the eternal state. Now, there's another view called preterism, which comes from the Latin term praetor, which means past or beyond. Preterists are divided themselves into two main camps full preterism, and partial preterism. Full preterists hold that all significant events of prophecy, including the millennium, the second coming, um, uh, which preterists see as a spiritual coming, that they all were fulfilled in A.D. 70, when the Jewish temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Uh, and consequently, full preterists believe that we are in the final state now. Now, partial preterists hold that uh, most of the uh, major eschatological events were fulfilled in A.D. 70, but they hold that Christ will physically come to the earth in the future and set up the final state. I hope you're not too confused by all this. I'm just going through the major positions. We will talk about this in much more detail in subsequent lectures. But a few more terms to define. I talked about tribulation and great tribulation. Now, tribulation simply refers to persecution of believers. Now, dispensationalists, the dispensational premillennialists, have interpreted Daniel 9, verse 27 as a key passage in their entire 
theology and eschatology, they think that there will be in the future a seven-year tribulation, primarily directed against the nation of Israel just before Christ comes again. Now, the Great Tribulation is thought of as a time of more intense persecution uh, at the end of the general seven-year tribulation. Now, most historic premillennialists, amillennialists, and postmillennialists disagree with the dispensationalists' interpretation of Daniel 27. Uh, they see tribulation as being one of the things that characterizes this entire period between Christ's first coming uh, and his second coming. Although the uh, intensity of persecution may well, and I think probably will, uh, increase before Christ's, uh, Christ comes again. Now, preterists hold that the tribulation was a past event related to the siege and overthrow of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Um, and so, if you think about it, uh, amillennialists in particular uh, would hold that we are not only in the thousand years, but we are also experiencing uh, tribulation because the church has been persecuted throughout history. Uh, but although amillennialists would hold that uh, tribulation and persecution probably will increase not too long before Christ uh, comes again, but as to how long, we don't know. Um, now, then there are the terms pre-tribulationism, mid-tribulationism, and post-tribulationism. Uh, pre-tribulation is a distinctly dispensationalist idea. <laughs> Pre-tribulationists believe that before the tribulation, because they define tribulation as being only the seven years, <coughs> pardon me, right before Christ comes again, Pre-tribulationists believe that Christ will come partway from heaven to earth to rapture, take away to heaven, the church. Now, a variant of this is what's known as mid-tribulation. They believe that Christ will rapture the church in the middle of the seven-year tribulation, just before the great tribulation. Now, both pre-tribulationists and mid-tribulationists believe that after the tribulation, Christ will come again only this time all the way to the earth to set up the thousand-year kingdom. And after there's a great rebellion, uh, then he will establish the final state. On the other hand, post-tribulationism holds that Christ will return only after the church goes through tribulation. Post-tribulationists believe that the rapture of living believers will take place along with the resurrection of the dead when Christ uh, returns. In other words, for pre-tribulationists, for dispensationalists, the rapture, and that means the, the snatching away, the taking away of living saints, is separate from the resurrection. And it's separated in time, okay, by seven years or three and a half years. Um, but uh, everybody else uh, believes, including historic uh, uh Millennialists, post-millennialists, and amillennialists uh, believe that the rapture and the resurrection, the rapture of living saints, in other words, the change uh, to give us our new bodies, uh, the rapture of living saints and the resurrection of dead people will all occur as part of one event, not separated in, in time by seven years or by three and a half years. Um, I hope that is not confusing. One nice thing about a video lecture is you can go back uh, and, uh, if, what was he saying there? And then listen to it again. And that's another reason why I think it's important uh, to have the book so you can read these things, because these are terms you may not have been familiar with beforehand. There are a number of good books uh, that assess the strengths and weaknesses of the different uh, views, and I list a number of very good ones in the hard copy or, or, or in the book, which is on, uh, the, uh, on the website. So with that introduction to biblical eschatology, the study of the last things, we've looked at the main issues and given at least 
uh, basic definitions of the major views. In the next lecture, we will look at how to interpret prophecy and apocalyptic, and then following that, we will go through uh, the, uh, the essence of uh, uh, eschatology by looking at the overall structure, the Old Testament, uh, es ex eschatological expectations, uh, the significant of uh, significance of Christ's first coming, then look at the overall eschatological structure and the significance of Christ's second coming. We will give a historical overview of eschatological thought, look at uh, the major uh, positions on the millennium in more detail, and then look at the major eschatological passages as well as talking about the significance of all of this. So there is much to come. It's a fascinating subject, and I hope you will learn much, uh, and it will increase your biblical understanding and cause you to appreciate the Bible so much more.